Well, hello. Good Shabbos to everyone. And this is the uh, 17th thing segment of the reading of Las Fersher's uh, study and book on the socialist response to anti-Semitism in the German imperial state at the time of the Second International, the Marxist International. Okay. Actually, the 18th uh, segment. Okay, here we go. Okay, now we're picking up from page at the end of page 145. And it says, whatever the Social Democrats' response to Lucis's stance vis-a-vis anti-Semitism and the Jews may or may not have been at the turn of the century, one thing we do know for sure. The position he formulated in 1919 in no way impeded his post-war career in the party. For the revolutionary events of 1918-1990 finally did make a social democrat proper of Hans Luce, and no mere ordinary member either. Luce now emerged as a leading social democrat in Mecklenburg-Strelitz, where he was elected to the Langtad and became the chairman of the social democratic faction. Fraction. He refused to become prime minister, opted instead to chair the bulk of the crucial select committees, including the Lanz Aschus. Okay. In the year of his death, he was elected as the Landrost, resident magistrate of Stargard. This made Stargard's historical castle his final home where he died as a sort of social democratic lord of the manor. Hmm. Lewis remained a controversial figure, to be sure, and it's hard to imagine he would have wanted it any other way. But it was certainly not his occasional comments on anti-Semitism and the Jews that made him controversial. We might note in passing that his, yeah, it wasn't controversial because, you know, everybody else was anti-Semitic, except for Engels. We might note in passing that his friend and colleague, Helmut von Gerlach, published his first short conversion narrative in January 1920. For all the questions that Gerlach's account raises, it was certainly meant as a response to the new quality that political anti-Semitism was taking on in the post-revolutionary landscape. Oh yeah? Gerlach began to grapple with this issue. In other words, even while Luce was still alive, maintained his defiant rather than self-critical stance. This does not rule out that he might eventually have shifted from defiance to critical engagement had he lived to witness the political developments of the 20s and 30s. But during his lifetime, he certainly did not pick up on the new quality of post-war political anti-Semitism, post-World, First World War. Lucis's position in his editorial on war anti-Semitism did differ in one extremely important respect, though, from that reflected in his earlier pro pronouncements. This fundamental difference lies in his general approach rather than the specific content of his remarks. As we saw, writing in the Zekunft 25 years earlier, Luce had insisted that anti-Semitism was by no means quote, restricted to anti-Semitic negation, unquote. Hmm. Hence, it was quite, quote, unjust to accuse anti-Semitism of amounting to more than dull anti-Jewish incitement. Hmm. Now, in his editorial on war anti-Semitism, he suggested something radically different. What set the serious people and their legitimate critique of Jewry apart from the anti-Semites? What set them apart was the fact that they are not so stupid immediately to make the Jewish question the pivot of world history as the anti-Semitic mystics do. They are too intelligent to believe the fools who would turn the Jewish question into a political procrustean bed and try to force the whole universe into it. The sensible ones oppose such an overestimation of Jewry. Unquote. Put slightly differently, 
Luce obviously now thought that anti-Semitism was, quote, a restricted to anti-Semitic negation, quote, and did amount to, quote, no more than dull anti-Jewish incitement, unquote. In part, this altered view is obviously a product of his own change in orientation. Most likely, his version of events went roughly like this. As one of the serious people with a legitimate critique of Jewry, he had got mixed up with the anti-Semites because he erroneously assumed that their perspective and aspirations amounted to far more than dull anti-Jewish incitement. Quote, unquote. When he realized his mistake, he drew the consequences and henceforth stuck with the serious people and their legitimate critique of Jewry, which was also anti-Semitic, of course. It is somewhat ironic that Luce himself had claimed in the Zekunft back in 1894 that the anti-Semitic movement did amount to far more than dull anti-Jewish assessment, incitement. Assuming he meant this claim seriously at the time, this the really interesting question Luce would have needed to ask himself was this, why did it seem to him then that the anti-Semites that have the sort of comp comprehensive orientation and program he now claimed they had lacked all along. Alternatively, Luce may have been trying to urge the anti-Semitic movement into adopting the sort of wider perspective and aspirations he felt it ought to have. In this case, just, just a moment. In this case, we might wonder what would have happened had he been more success, successful in this quest? What if the anti-Semitic movement really had managed to make its enmity towards Jewry the heart piece of a much more comprehensive ideological package deal, say, in the way the National Socialists did? In that case, Luce's critique would have been rendered obsolete and he would have been, had no reason to turn his back on the anti-Semitic movement. Yes, and in fact, he was one of the predecessors of the National Socialist paradigm. Okay, this is his newfound conviction. Just a minute, I need a drink. Okay, we continue with this 18th episode of the reading of Les Fischer's The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State during the time of the Second International. Okay, here we go. Second International, here we come. Now, Lucis's newfound conviction that anti-Semitism really did amount to no more than dull anti-Jewish incitement is not only the product of his own political biography, though. Rather, more specific, significantly, it reflects an important dimension of a fundamental sea change in the perceptions of anti-Semitism from the middle of the war onward that I mentioned earlier. The political anti-Semitism that re-emerged in force during the war and the revolutionary period was itself part and parcel of a more comprehensive ideological and political agenda. Uh -huh. But people increasingly stopped using the term anti-Semitism to refer to that overreaching agenda as a whole. Instead, they now used it more and more often, specifically to denote the anti-Jewish dimension of that agenda. As we saw, the term anti-Semitic could previously refer to any number of positions taken or qualities displayed by anti-Semites. Now it became increasingly accepted that the term ought only to be applied to positions specifically to do with the Jews. Early on in the war, an editorial on war anti-Semitism might well still have focused on some attitude towards the war formulated or displayed by people known to be political anti-Semites. By January 1919, it would have been highly surprising for such an editorial to deal with anything other than specifically with anti-Jewish propaganda and activism. From late 1915 or early 1916 onwards, we can be increasingly certain that critics taking issue with anti-Semitism were now specifically criticizing the anti-Semites. <clears throat> Excuse me. Criticizing the anti-Semites' anti-Jewish stance. 
This by no means implies that we would necessarily agree with their reasons for doing so. Most anti anti judaophobes still remained indifferent towards a wealth of anti-Jewish sentiment that they found unproblematic, but struck us as obviously anti-Semitic. Nevertheless, this change in perspective is a fundamental one. By the time we reach the early Weimar years, we finally can assume that anti-Semitism did take issue specifically with anti-Jewish positions, no matter how contentious the criteria it applied in doing so may still have been by our standards. Hmm. Okay, by the time we reach the early Weimar years, we finally can assume that anti judeophobia did take issues specifically with anti-Jewish positions, no matter how contentious the criteria it applied in doing so may still have been by our standards. Okay. Next is chapter six, anti-Semitism and the Jewish question in Dresden. Let's see now, what page is this? 149, okay. Perceptions and prescriptions regarding the Jews may have been irrelevant to the way in which the delegates to the Congress in Dresden judged the former anti-Semite Hans Luce, but they were by no means absent from the debate. In this chapter, I will discuss four relevant issues that did feature in Dresden. Arden's Jewish origin, Wilhelm Lichnick's infamous critique of Dreyfusards, the decision of the Party Congress of 1892 to postpone its debate on anti-Semitism, and finally, Mehring's idiosyncrasies in the field. As we will see, these issues were brought up in a casual and unsophisticated manner, yet failed to precipitate any sort of critical response from the delegates. This not only makes it inconceivable that the delegates should at the same time have been anything other than at best indifferent to Lucis's relevant notions. It also throws that indifference all the more sharply into relief. Casual, often almost unconscious, allusions to anti-Semitism and the Jews spontaneously sprang to mind in virtually any situation, except when it really mattered. When assessing the merits of a former anti-Semites, for example, all interest in these issues mysteriously disappeared. Okay. Now we start with uh, Hardin's Jewish background. <clears throat> Throughout his speech in Mehring's defense, Babel persistently referred to Hardin as Witkowski Hardin. This was a reference to Hardin's birth name, Felix Ernest Witkowski, or rather to the fact that Hardin was not his birth name. Prima Fasi, this reference seems innocent enough. Babel explained that he had only recently become aware of Hardin. He had, however, had, quote, the honor of knowing Witkowski Hardin's father. To be introduced to the son, I would not count as an honor. From the floor, bravo. Old Witkowski, by contrast, was a good Democrat, quote, unquote. In the 1860s, he had spent, quote, not only many a pleasant evening with his honorable man, but also many a serious night discussing problems all together until dawn. To this day, I recall the conversations with Witkowski Hardin's father with pleasure. In changing his name, so the apparent implication, Hardin had disowned his father's democratic background. But this debate did not transpire in a vacuum. Imperial German society was obsessed with Jewish names and the extent to which Jews should or should not be allowed to modify or change their names. The anti-Semitic obsession with the invisibility of the emancipated Jew lent the issue additional emotive force, making it the object of a protracted debate 
that spanned the entire period from the pre to the post emancipatory era. Nobody in Imperial Germany could have been oblivious to this debate and any reference to the name change of an individual of Jewish extraction like Hardin invariably invoked the dynamics of that entire debate. <sighs> Many accepted that the stigmatized auction of Jewish names was in fact a healthy and legitimate one. These names were seen, were seen as a sort of tracking device that would allow non-Jewish society to chart the extent of Jewish integration. No matter how comprehensively Jewish individuals assimilated, they would remain recognizable by their names. As it became increasingly impossible to tell them apart by any other means, their distinct names emerged as the one remaining safeguard. How should non-Jewish society control, and if need be, curtail or reverse, the process of Jewish integration if it could no longer tell the Jews apart? Oh, horror. This obsession with Jewish names was usually rationalized and formulated as a moralizing indictment against the Jews. The belief in the immutability of ethnic and racial distinctions was becoming ever more pervasive. Consequently, the notion that one could simply shed one's identity appeared not only futile, but also contemptible. Also true. Given that one could never genuinely take on an alternative identity, betrayal of one's racial ethnic identity emerged as a cardinal sin in its own right. If assimilation could not work. Any attempt to assimilate was by definition opportunistic and represented an attempt to ingratiate oneself under false pretexts, even though that was demanded of the Jewish people. <laughs> In France, if you want to become a citizen, they expect you to change your first name. <laughs> you know, okay. And that's today. <laughs> okay. Yes. And I would reiterate that my attempt to claim my Polish citizenship has met with uh, silence at, after five years or so because they don't consider my parents who were born in Poland to have been citizens. And of course, they had to escape into the Soviet Union in order to avoid the Nazis. And they didn't leave with a passport. And that's what's demanded of them now. Okay. So, you know, integration, yeah. Well, it's assimilation that they mean. Integration is something else. The Jews as this identity might be inferior, but that made its betrayal no less of a sin than that of any other racial ethnic identity. Yes, it is a sin to avoid your Jewish identity. In everyday discourse, people were, of course, perfectly capable of combining both indictments. The Jews did not do enough to assimilate, but when they did at least try, they did so with an abandon and obsequiousness that made them all the more creepy and, and subversive. Whoa. Yes, that's true. This offers us a good reminder of the fact that anti-Semitic mindset not only does not depend on the truth value of the assumptions it subscribes to, but does not even require these assumptions to be logically consistent with one another. <laughs> Oh, what greater indictment is there? What is more? Oh, I don't... What is more? The rights of individuals of Jewish extraction to change their names were in fact curtailed yet further less than a fortnight after the Congress in Dresden. On September the 25th, 1903, the Prussian Minister of the Interior issued a decree limiting the rights of baptized Jews to change their family names, even if they were that baptized. Oh, yoy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Imagine that. After all the the, the uh, turmoil of deciding to convert and becoming baptized Jews, not even allowed to change their family names because they're still considered to be Jewish. Okay. <laughs> This is Spain, 1492, all over again. This may be an uncanny coincidence. Conversely, this decree may have been preceded by a new bout of public debate on the matter so that Babel was consciously 
playing to that very debate. As I said before, it was in any case impossible to raise the fact that somebody of Jewish extraction had changed his or her name without evoking the dynamics of this entire discourse. If Babel's only motive had been to reproach Hardin for giving up a name that was widely respected in democratic circles, he would have needed to actively distance himself from all the other premises and implications he was invariably conjuring up by raising the issue. Mm -hmm. Hardin, in his response to Babel's critique, summed up the logic of the argument as follows. Quote, somebody who changes his name, especially if it is his goal to influence public affairs, is indeed suspicious, all the more so if the new name sounds German, while the discarded one had an Semitic ring. Surely the reader will then think, this pushy individual has changed his name to cover up his Jewish origin and avoid spoiling his career. Unquote. Hardin even conceded that, quote, the prejudice is understandable, unquote. Oh, oh, understandable. Why? No reason given. Okay. But in his case, it was unfounded. His father had eventually become mentally ill and abusive towards his family, whose reputation was severely tarnished as a consequence. His family had therefore officially been granted the right to give up its original name. Officially. Wow. How wonderful. Whoa. Lucky man. Hardin himself had kept the pseudonym he had already begun to use as a young actor. The accusation then as a young actor. Huh. That was before his father went crazy, right? Uh-huh. Okay. The accusation then that he had changed his name in order to cover up his Jewish origin and avoid spoiling his career was utterly unfounded. In this respect, people might like to look for suspects closer to home, Arden suggested. La Salle, after all, had abandoned the straightforward transliteration of his Yiddish family name and said, given it a French parents. <laughs> oh, yes, La Salle. Oh, that, quote, apparently does not outrage Babel, unquote. Yet, Babel was taking him hardened to task, even though, quote, I did not change my name as an ambitious author, as La Salle had done, but as a child. Oh, as a child, an anti-Semitic child. Okay. Babel was not, in fact, the first to bring up the issue of Hardin's Jewish background. Let us recall that the whole dispute did, that boiled over in Dresden began with an article in Nyzeit, in which Mehring, encouraged by Kautsky, criticized Bernhard for publishing his article on party morals in the Zukunft. In that same article, Mehring categorized Hardin as follow. Still a Polish Jew, only a moment ago, Herr Hardin fights for the imperial German throat and altar with a Christian baptismal certificate and the Germanic defiance of Arminius and the Cheruscum one moment, only to play the sole freedom fighter and libertarian who still dares to speak his mind in Germany the next. Mm -hmm. In short, the issue of Hardin's Jewish extraction had resonated throughout this conflict from its inception. That would have made it all the more imperative for Babel to clarify that he did and did not want to imply by raising the issue of Hardin's name chain, especially if he had any misgivings about Mehring's treatment of Hardin as a Polish Jew. Consequently, we can only assume that Babel was indeed intentionally tapping into the sentiments that govern the discourse on Jewish names and name changes in Imperial Germany. Oh, yeah. Wow, what a subtitle. Wilhelm Liechnicht, Karl Kraus, and the Frackel. In the context of his all out assault on Mehring at the Congress in Dresden, Heinrich Braun contended that socialists had, in fact, not only at all times contributed to non socialist periodicals. On occasion, on, a, on occasion, they had even collaborated with publications that were clearly anti-socialist. A good example for this, Brown added, were Wilhelm Liefnick's contribution to the Frackel, the Viennese journal published by Karl Krauss, 1874 to 1936. Victor Adler, the leader of the Austrian party, oh, who also happened to be Brown's brother-in-law, had rep repeatedly been abused by the Frackel. 
you know, Victor Adler, you know, was uh, the second leader of the uh, Munich uh, Revolution of 1918, and he was killed subsequently. Victor Adler is Jewish himself, and uh, he, uh, together with the leading anarchists at the time, actually carried out a, uh, a revolutionary insurrection in Munich in 1918, at the, about the same time as the uh, revolutionary insurrection in Berlin by Luxembourg and uh, Liebknecht, all of whom Jewish, all of whom were killed or assassinated. Okay, Victor Adler had repeatedly been abused by the Frankel. His attitude towards social democracy was, what about, as despicable and impertinent as it gets, unquote. All this notwithstanding, Liebknecht had thought nothing of contributing to the Franco. Nor had it been just some harmless literary essay that Liebknecht had published there, <coughs> but, quote, a very important political article, <coughs> one of which he had to realize that it could bring a brother party into an extremely difficult situation. It was an article on the Dreyfus Affair that had promptly precipitated, quote, quite extraordinary difficulties for the French party back then and for years to come, unquote. Oh, yeah. Brown's reference to Liebknecht's anti-Dreyfusard articles in the Frackle is in many ways remarkably similar to Fisher's subsequent reference to Mehring's dealings with Luce. It is no more than a coincidence that the example Brown chose for the collaboration of a leading social democrat with an anti-socialist publication dealt with anti-Semitism. It would have made no difference to his line of argument had Liebknecht's article dealt with any other topic of some political significance, just as it would have been it would have made no difference to Fisher's critique of Mehring. Had Luce been a former political opponent coming from some other party that did not happen to be self-avowedly anti-Semitic. Since Brown's only interest in Liefenich's anti-Dreyfusard's articles lay in the fact that they appeared in the anti-socialist periodically, he only needed to mention their existence. There was no need to say anything more about them. Their content was of no relevance to his line of argument. Since these art articles by Liefenich did not seem to have drawn much attention in the Anglophone literature. They merit a fairly detailed discussion. <sighs> they were all written and published in the Freckle after Dreyfus's retrial. The first three were also issued separately as a pamphlet. They were, to say the least, Remarkable and certainly had repercussions for the French socialists. Liefnick declared squarely at the outset that, quote, I do not believe in the innocence of the French Captain Dreyfus. Oh, oh, what is going on here? He had not wanted to say this publicly before the end of the trial in Reims, so as not quote, to vindicate the riffraff that yearned for the condemnation of the Jew, unquote. That Dreyfus had many unpleasant opponents did not mean, though, that there were only pure and honest people among his supporters. Hmm. Among them, one could discern, quote, a strong whiff of Panama, unquote, he added, setting the tone for much of us to follow. The first great injustice, unquote, unquote, committed by Dreyfus's supporters was that they had, quote, lumped together the esp espionage department of the French general staff with the entire general staff, indeed with the entire army apparatus, unquote. Even Nick explained. Hmm. Quote, that this man injustice was not entirely unintentional is demonstrated by the fact that the leaders of the campagne Campagne, as they stated thousands of times and hinted at hundreds of thousands of times, assumed that the French general staff had knowingly sentenced an innocent man. But surely the only interest of the general staff could be to identify and seize the guilty party, and that the Jew Dreyfus 
should have been sent to Devil's Island merely due to anti-Jewish hatred is an assumption that flies in the face of all psychology and common sense. Hmm, unless they were anti-Semitic. The anti-Semitic movement was very weak in France at, in 1894. Its proponents were ridiculed. It had grown somewhat stronger since, but mainly as a result of the campaign. This is by now familiar territory, of course. The real responsibility for the rise of political anti-Semitism always lies with the Jews themselves, or put a little more politely, with the philo-Semites. Quote, no one will suspect me of any sympathy for the anti-Semites, Liebnick went on. <laughs> Quote, but whatever my opinion about the hatred of men like Lieberman versus Sonnenberg, Vockel, Alward, and their comrades may be, I would never think them capable, should they find themselves as judges, of declaring a Jew guilty of a crime that justifies a death penalty merely because he is a Jew and of sending him to the dry guillotine, unquote. Hmm. Prima facie, this may seem like a remarkable shift in focus. We might be tempted to interpret Liefnick's initial claim that it was unfair to hold the entire French general staff responsible for Dreyfus's fate as follows. Individuals within general staff may have plotted against Dreyfus, but that does not make the general staff as an institution responsible. These individuals may have had anti-Semitic motives, but that does not justify accusing the whole apparatus of institutional anti-Semitism, even though they remain silent. Yet the analogy he then introduced made it clear that this was not what he meant. Oh, not even the anti-Semites as dedicated to the cause as Lieberman von Sundenberg, Buckel and Albart, he suggested, would divert the course of justice to sentence an innocent man simply because he is a Jew. Liebnick's point, then, was not that an institution cannot be held responsible in its entirety for the anti-Semitism of some of those who hold responsibility within it. His point was that even dedicated anti-Semites would not let their anti-Semitism cloud their judgment and corrupt their sense of duty. Whoa, Liebnick says that. If even leading anti-Semites would now not sink so low, how much less was it that the authorities would do so? Oh, yeah. <sighs> Hence, quote, should someone say to me, urged by one minister versus Gosler, a Prussian court-martial has found a German officer of Jewish nationality guilty of espionage for France, knowing that he is innocent simply because he is a Jew, I would consider him mad. Unquote. In short, I unquote, I do not believe in Dreyfus's innocence, unquote, he reiterated. Oh. So the accusers were not anti-Semites. Oh, they were anti-Semites, but they didn't do it for anti-Semitic reasons. You know, that's what he said. Yeah. Liebnick. Wow. Yet Liebnick still had his main trump up its sleeve. Quote, it is likely, unquote. He asked, quote, would it be possible for the government for whom he allegedly or presumably committed that act of treason could tolerate it that an innocent man is imprisoned for five years because of this act of treason and treated as Dreyfus has been treated? This question I had to answer with no. Uh -huh. He then explained the source of his uncertainty on the matter. Quote, I know he stated apodictically, ap hmm. quote, that a sort of unwritten international law concerning governmental military espionage exists. Unquote. One of its stipulations was, quote, that an innocent person indicted for espionage is released immediately if the government for whom the act of treason had been committed informally declares that the person in question is innocent. Hmm. Since this obviously not happened in Dreyfus's case, I was compelled to conclude that Dreyfus was not innocent. Oh, so <laughs> it's Prussian Germany that determines whether or not Dreyfus was innocent. His doubts were, quote unquote, hardly alleviated 
on the quote statements of the German envoy in Paris in 1894 and the more recent one by the Secretary of State Bulo became public. Clearly, quote, these were the conventional formulae that simply expressed the conventional lie the government is, quote, neither directly nor indirectly quote, involved with space, spies, unquote. The imperial German government actually had denied that Dreyfus was a German spy, in other words, but had done so in public statements instead of utilizing the correct informal channels with which Liebknecht claimed to be so intimately familiar. Huh. Far from confirming Dreyfus's innocence, these declarations hence made him look all the more guilty. Oy, oy. Certainly difficult to be Jewish and innocent. One had to be pretty foolish then to assume Dreyfus may might conceivably be innocent. Why would the Dreyfusards nonetheless insist so willfully and against all odds that Dreyfus had been wrongly convicted? What were their motives in going to such lengths to distort the facts and claim that Dreyfus was innocent? And why were the Dreyfusards so oblivious to the obvious fact that their campaign could only backfire? As Liebnik confessed, he had, quote, said privately in a conversation with a supporter of the Dreyfusard Karls that the leaders of the Campagne deserved to be beaten up for the way in which they harmed their own cause and assisted the anti-Semites and reactionaries. Unquote. Hmm. So he himself was not an anti-Semitic in other words, really. In the event, Dreyfus had now had his retrial. Not that, it was, that this was down to Dreyfus Yards. Dreyfus Yards, Ibnick added, the need for a retrial had arisen as a result of the, quote, ex the exposure of the forger Henry by the bete noire of the revisionist war minister Gavagnac, unquote. At the end of the retrial, Dreyfus had been convicted yet again. Admittedly, quote, Dreyfus's guilt had not been proven, but neither had his innocence. And no one should keep in mind that direct, definite evidence seldom exists in the espionage trials. A single word from the German government would have rescued him had it known him to be innocent. And this word was not spoken. And yet it was. Against this background, the decision of the French government to pardon Dreyfus was not logical, but sensible. Leibniz concluded his first article in the Frackle. Ah, oh, that's why he had to publish in the Frackle, because it was anti-Semitic. He then began his second article by addressing the outcome of the retrial. Dreyfus had been found guilty again, but the recognition of mitigating circumstances had led to a less harsh sentence. Some people interpreted this outcome as, quote, as evidence of doubt concerning the guilt of the convicted man, unquote, Liebnick explained. This was, quote, a totally arbitrary assumption, unquote. Admittedly, mitigating circumstances were often acknowledged when a person's guilt was in doubt. Quote, even more frequently, however, unquote, this also held true in Dreyfus's case, quote, they are granted due to humanitarian considerations, unquote. So he contends that Dreyfus was still guilty. What weighed even more heavily in favor of the assumption that Dreyfus was guilty was his, quote, immediate acceptance of the pardon, unquote. This decision was, quote, not heroic, just humane. Yes, Dreyfus has, was never acquitted, still has never been acquitted by France. <laughs> you know. But why retract the appeal? The Dreyfus press Quote unquote. The Dreyfus Press simply states, because otherwise the pardon could not proceed. That is true, but only in the most literal sense, and it throws dust in people's eyes. What prevents Dreyfus from waiting for the outcome of the appeal? After everything that he has been through, a few weeks more or less surely do not matter, and his prison in France was quite bearable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like leave him there in prison, you know, like it doesn't matter. Had his awareness of his innocence and his wish to see it publicly proven been as strong as is purported, then he could, to my mind, 
never have acted as he has. His desire to get out of prison was certainly greater than his desire to prove his innocence. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He has voluntarily relinquished the best and most immediate chance of ascertaining the truth. The most certainly does not speak for Dreyfus's innocence. Oh, yeah. Put him back in prison then. Unquote. That's Liebknecht. Publishing in an anti-socialist uh, journal. Yes. Uh-huh. Now, like many of his peers, Liebknecht had been a political prisoner himself. His first wife was the daughter of a prison guard whom he met during his imprisonment following the revolution of 1848. <laughs> like Babel, Liebknecht had spent two years in prison for treason because of his refusal to support Bismarck's handling of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-71. Most recently, already a man of 70, Liebknecht had been incarcerated for four months for Les Majesté in 1996, when he mentioned how this had offered him the opportunity to study the French press in detail as the Dreyfus affair gradually began to unfold in earnest. Social democracy, like many political movements, took pride in the steadfastness with which its members refused to be intimidated by repression and imprisonment in a city conviction, convictions that were politically motivated as a badge of honor. Like many political movements, it also found it immensely difficult to acknowledge and cope with the human cost that repression and imprisonment frequently exacted from those affected and the toll it took it upon their physical and mental health. Unless you're talking about Dreyfus. Leibniz was certainly in a better position than most to suggest that Dreyfus should have been seen through an appeal even that meant staying in prison for the time being. Yet even Leibniz had never been deported to a tropical penal colony. <laughs> Against the backdrop of this experience, the relative comfort of Travis's current prison regime was presumably neither here nor there, and the urgency of his desire to be free surely merits a rather more charitable interpretation than the one Liebnick offered. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Obviously. Whew. Okay, I need to take a break. Okay, here we go. Zeref Shabbos. Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech Olam. Ahavik Ner Shabbos. Okay, let's do a a final reading for this. Now we go to share and do a final reading here for today. Okay. So, Liebnick then began to categorize the Dreyfusard campaign, quote, pretense and publicity, publicity and pretense, marche in reclame, reclame in marche, he began, quote, never has there been as pretentious a publicity campaign on such a gigantic scale, pretentious. It only had one fault. Never has pretension been more visible and palpable and blatant and never more cliched and crude. Nimash, Chablo, Nine Masig, Plumper. In part, it was a stringently performed concert, in part, a well he he rehearsed racket, both with a single conductor as every sign all the participants followed. 
one motion of the baton, and in Paris, London, Berlin, Vienna, New York, and everywhere else, the same singing, blowing, whistling, hissing, speak, squeaking, and yelling. And then the people act surprised when the notion of a syndicate arises. Syndicate. He means conspiracy theory. Accusing Dreyfusards of being conspiracy. When 500 papers of all descriptions in all manner of countries simply, simultaneously strike up the same melody once or twice a day, and more often still than that can surely be uh, hardly be pure coincidence, quote unquote. It had been a monumental mistake, quote unquote, he continued, quote, to justify Jewry's cause with that of Dreyfus. After all, quote, is Jewry guilty then when one Jew has perpetuated the crime? No sensible person in France or elsewhere had any intention of holding the Jews accountable for Dreyfus, quote, he claimed. By contrast, quote, the involvement of Jews in the Panama swindle provided far more grist to the anti-Semitic mill. And lo and behold, heroes and victims of the Panama swindle stood at the helm of the movement for Dreyfus. Thus, the stupidity of identifying Dreyfus's cause with that of Jewry in its entirety was supplemented by the probable, even greater stupidity of dragging the nasty odor of the Panama affair into the Dreyfus affair. The consequence of this identification of Jewry with Dreyfus could only be that Dreyfus's second conviction turned into a defeat inflicted on Jewry, unquote. All that, however, quote, is comparatively insignificant. The political education and sense of equality <clears throat> are too strong in France for the anti-Semitic movement to become dangerous and permanent. Far more dangerous is the effect that campaign has on has had on militarism in France, unquote. The Dreyfusard campaign had, you know, the campaign in effect is equivalent to the Vichy government, you know, under the Nazis. Hmm. The Dreyfusard campaign had, quote, insulted national feelings and aroused, aroused wild protest, and it has made the army popular and provided militarism with a triumph. It will take a long time. Unquote. Leibniz concluded in this second article, quote, before the movement against militarism in France reaches the strength again that it had acquired before the affair, unquote. Leibniz's third article in the Frackle was a response, third article in the Frackle was a response to some of the objections raised against his previous line of argument. The revisionists claimed that Dreyfus out, 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 out Oud, <laughs> English is so difficult, owed his retrial to their efforts. Quote, that is wrong, unquote, Leibniz explained. Quote, I am in fact convinced that had the campaign or the Vichy never taken place, the appeal would have been heard far sooner, unquote. The campaign had been based on, quote, tactics of hysterical madness, unquote, and, quote, the only thing that continues to mystify me is how there could ever have been people outside of psychiatric institutions who engaged in such stupidity, approved of it, and even admired it. The ugliest, most repulsive feature of the affair and its pretensions, however, is the inner insincerity, the mendacious hypocrisy of this comedy of outrage, this most hypocritical comedy of outrage, unquote. Towards the end of the third article, he then asks, who is still talking about the affair? It would be, quote, only a few more weeks, and then the word Dreyfus would have been forgotten. As far as cultural history goes, that would be a shame, he added. After all, posterity could grant the campagne, Vichy, pride of place next to Pied Piper Crusades of the Children, the St. Vitius's dance, and the mass processions of the dancing dervishes. Unquote. As Krauss reported some weeks later, quote, a nationalist fortnightly journal, the Action Francaise, edited by Maurice Barre, had translated Leibniz's Leibniz articles in extenso and distributed them throughout France in more than 100,000 copies. Unquote. Numerous smaller papers, including the anti Semitic flag, flagship La Libre Parole, the 
the free voice, the yeah, the the free free words, had quoted extensively from them since. Was this not an embarrassing situation? Not according to Kras. For those who were quoting Liebnik actually had nothing in common with him. Quote, men who swim in a tributary where the current flows backwards boast that they are swimming in parallel with Liebnik, who is struggling against the tide in the main river. Unquote, he explained. In the independent socialists, La Petite République, its editor-in-chief, Alfred Léon Guerrero Richard, born 1860, had bemoaned the fact that Liefnick's articles provided the opponents of the Dreyfusard socialists, quote, with weapons that are all the more murderous because they were wielded by the hands of a friend, unquote. Yeah. Yet Gerard de Richard assumed that once Liebnik saw how his articles were being exploited, he would, quote, regret having laid himself open to the risk of being translated and utilized in this way, unquote. In fact, Klaus added, quote, I know that he regrets nothing. Unquote. At the Socialist Congress in Paris, Leibniz, Leibniz's stance had even, quote, led to an incident, unquote. Klaus continued, Krauss continued, quote, Herr Jondi, editor of Petite République and of Aurore, exclaimed, quote, down with Leibniz, when the Dreyfus affair came up, the man was published a punished accordingly. Fuck. You know, like someone who's speaking up finally against anti-Semitism gets it published. Punished. Okay. Not published, but punished. Yeah. In the following edition of the Frackel, Krauss published a letter Liebnik had written for to the Petite Republic, the socialist. In it, Liebnik retorted that, quote, you reprimand me for my new friends. I could reprimand you for yours, unquote. Socialist Dreyfusard's associates. Put simply, if you accuse me of promoting anti-Semitism, I'll accuse you of promoting philo-Semitism. <laughs> Wonderful. What a great debate. Yeah. Clearly then, Liebling too subscribed to the logic of philo-Semitism discourse and assumed that he could score points by making a threat of this kind. The following summer, it was reported that Dreyfus had told the correspondent of the Secolo of Milan, the Italian Republican, Giuseppe de Felici, 1859-1920, that he hoped the propaganda associated with his name would abate soon. If only then could he hope for, a due, for the due legal process that could ascertain the truth. In response to these reports, Liebnik submitted yet another article to the Frackle. He was triumphant in his apparent vindication. He did not know whether Dreyfus had read his articles in the Frackle. He wrote, quote, but if he has, then he has vindicated everything I said. If not, we would be looking at a correspondence between Dreyfus's statement and the next analysis that is almost as miraculous as that between the 70 Alexandrian translators of the Old Testament, unquote. Dreyfus had clearly identified what indeed characterized the whole affair namely, quote, that its concern was not to ascertain the truth about the guilt or innocence of Captain Dreyfus, but to use Dreyfus's case for a campaign that could not but result in the backlash of French national feeling that would benefit militarism and anti-Semitism, unquote. The alleged hatred of the French towards Jewry, quote, exists only in the imagination of those who claim that it exists. Until the affair was conjured up, no anti-Semitic movement existed in France. The fools like Drummond, who railed against the Jews as the sole cause of all social maladies, were loners, took the whole ingenious clumsiness of the Dreyfus campaign uh, to artificially produce an anti-Semitic movement. Oh, so anti-Semitism didn't exist, you know, so how come Dreyfus was charged? As for Dreyfus himself, quote, if he has evidence for his sense, unquote, Liebknecht concluded, we can only hope that he received the opportunity presented. But to do so, he would, quote, clearly have to remember the prophet, God protects, protect me from my friends. So he charges Dreyfus with the responsibility of having to prove his innocence, 
rather than the prosecution prosecution having to prove his guilt. Wow. In one important respect, of course, Lee Nix's stance stood absolutely sui generis. That is unique. It was predicted on the assumption that Dreyfus was indubitably guilty. Nix makes it difficult to compare the implications of his arguments to the tactical prescriptions of other socialists at the time. The crucial question presented by Jean Jaurès to prominent socialists in 1899, whether the movement could, quote, without abandoning the principle of class struggle, unquote, take sides in a conflict, quote, among various bourgeois factions, whether to save political liberty or, as in Dreyfus affair, to defend humanity, unquote, presupposed Dreyfus's firmly established innocence. Leibniz's uh, stand neither answered that particular question in the negative, nor did those who answered it in the affirmative thereby refute Leibniz's assessment. On the other hand, given the vehemence of Leibniz's scorn vis-à-vis -vis the Dreyfusards, one cannot help wondering whether his apodictic insistence on <coughs> Dreyfus's guilt was not in fact a rationalization and thus and the stubbornness with which he maintained it a reflection of the unsettling effect the anti judephobic aspect of the Dreyfusard campaign had on him. The fact that Liebnik had, in fact, written to Krauss as late as 5th of August 1899 that, quote, I neither think Dreyfus guilty nor innocent, quote, would seem to underscore the suggestion. Huh. So Liebnik had doubts. Leaving the issue of Dreyfus's guilt or innocence aside for a moment, though, the verve of Leibniz's malicious and by clearly delusional portrayal of the Dreyfusard campaign and the imagery he employed are surely remarkable, in spite of his doubts. This testifies to rather more than, quote, the incredible naivety Silberner saw in these articles and makes Silberner's conclusion that Leibniz's anti-Dreyfusard articles quote, contain not a word with as much as an anti-Semitic connotation, unquote, rather baffling. <laughs> Certainly, <laughs> you know. This is in many ways a good illustration of the problems created by attempts to reach an unambiguous juxtaposition of anti-Semites and non-anti-Semites in this context. According to the logic, this implies, quote, a word with an anti-Semitic connotation, unquote, must be part of an anti-Semitic remark, unquote which invariably renders the text in which it features an anti-Semitic text and its author an anti-Semite. Yet we need classify neither his anti dreyfusard articles nor Leibniz himself as anti-Semitic in any straightforward sense of the word to maintain that his critique of the Dreyfusard campaign is highly problematic and in need of an explanation. It clearly bears testimony to an irrational approach whose dynamics we need to understand on their own terms in order to develop a more thorough understanding of fully fledged anti-Semitism and its virulence and pervasiveness in German society, both in the short and long term. Even amongst Liebnik, if we can either indict Liebnik as an anti-Semite or give an entirely clean bill of health, we have to dis disregard these dynamics and only probably be examined if we focus on the wider set of perceptions regarding the Jews, whose significance I've emphasized throughout this book. Ah, oh, okay. That's it for today. Get Shabbos. Shabbos, you know, is the first workers' holiday in all of history, which denotes Judaism as a working class religion and culture to begin with. Okay, good Shabbos again.